There are a couple of seats up here that are marked reserved, but actually not being used today. So there are four chairs. If anyone would like them, feel free to come and take them. Not take them home with you, sit in them. <laughs> I know the baseball season has just begun, but let's project down the line, shall we? And imagine it's the end of the season. It's the World Series, and it's Game 7. And your favorite team, whichever that may be, is in the World Series. And you have the home field advantage. So here it is, Game 7. This is it. The winner takes it all. And it's the bottom of the ninth inning, which means your team is losing because you're up at the bottom of the ninth and the, with the home field advantage and you're down by three runs. And the other team is bringing in its closer who is lights out. This man, it's very hard to get a hit against him. And in his arsenal of pitches, he only has two. He has a fastball, which is great, but he has a killer sinker as well, that when he releases it looks just like the fastball, but at the last minute ducks down and sinks out of the strike zone. And there's no way to know which one he's throwing. You can only figure it out when it gets there. Basically, take a guess at which one he's throwing. If you guess right, you may get a hit off it. But more often than not, people guess the wrong way. And sure enough, the first two batters on your team get up, guess the wrong way, and they both strike out. Things are looking pretty desperate, pretty gloomy. You're ready to go home and pack it in and say, ah, we lost this one. But one of the players on the team is observing the pitcher. And he notices something about him. You know how professional poker players, gamblers, uh, learn how to read people's body language to let them know when they're bluffing and when they're not? Well, this man, one of the players looks at the pitcher and he notices that his body language betrays what pitch he's about to show. And he realizes it. And he calls the next batter over and goes, I figured it out. Look at him. When he gets in his stretch, he says, if he flicks or, or shrugs his left shoulder, he's throwing the sinker. And if he doesn't, he's throwing the fastball. So the next batter gets up, and sure enough, that's exactly what happens. He's able to call the pitch, and he hits it and gets a hit. And then the next batter, and the next batter, they do the same thing, and all of a sudden the bases are loaded, and the guy after that, guess what, is your star hitter, and he hits a grand slam, and your team has won the victory. Now imagine the jubilation that would be taking place in the crowd that day when here they were ready to pack it in and they realize out of the jaws of death, of defeat, they've pulled out this victory. Imagine the announcers, what they're saying. I can't believe it. Never in the world have we seen an ending like this. What a sensational play. What an ending to a World Series. This will be remembered for decades to come. And then the players themselves jumping all over each other on the field. You can just see the picture. And the elation you have, your team has won. They grasped victory right out of the jaws of defeat. Well, if winning the World Series could bring that much joy, imagine what the, early, the first Christians, the apostles and the disciples of Jesus, must have felt when they finally realized and understood that Jesus was risen and what that meant for them. When Jesus died on the cross, they must have thought that everything was lost because they had a belief in their time about the Messiah that they got from the scriptures. They got the right answer, but the wrong way. Kind of like to think of like they added two plus two and got the square root of 16. They got the right answer, but they misunderstood it. They understood rightfully from the scriptures that the Messiah would live forever. They thought it meant he would never die. So. If you wanted to prove that somebody was not the Messiah, the easiest way to do it was to get him killed. And that's why the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, they were so adamant that Jesus, it was not enough for him to be scourged. He had to be put to death specifically so that his followers would disperse. They'd say, we followed another false Messiah and they'd disappear and the whole Jesus threat would be over. But when he rose from the dead, they didn't understand that he would die and rise and live forever. And once they understood that, then everything he had done made sense. His whole suffering, death, and his passion, all was to take all of the sin and all of the evil upon himself and destroy its power on the cross. And what Jesus actually did was defeat the devil with his own weapon. Satan, of course, it would take a whole course in theology to explain why Lucifer, the great archangel, decided to rebel against God. He wasn't happy enough being number two. He wanted to be number one, and he thought he was just as good as God. And so he rebelled against him, and Michael and the other archangels fought back. 
of course, and uh, Lucifer was defeated. And instead of apologizing to God, he brought absolute hatred for him and vowed he would get God back. And he couldn't tr destroy God because he had already tried and failed. So he figured the best way he could hurt God would be to hurt the children he loved more than anyone, and that is ourselves. Any one of you who are parents can understand that. Which would be more painful for you, to suffer pain yourself or watch your children suffer? Of course, without a moment's hesitation, you say, obviously, to watch my children suffer. And so Satan knew if he could just get us away from God, then he'd have his victory. And with original sin, Adam and Eve opened the door to him by disobeying God and falling for his trick, and they brought death into the world, and Satan's power was now at work. And this had become the kingdom of Satan, no longer the kingdom of God. And you and I inherit that original sin from Adam and Eve, and no matter how good we might try to be, there was nothing we could do when our lives were over. We would be condemned to Satan's kingdom, yes, literally condemned to hell for all eternity because heaven had been lost to us because of Adam and Eve's original sin. And so Satan had won the victory. And the only one powerful enough to change that was God himself. And God decided to change it, not by sending Michael the archangel again and the other angels against him, by, but by entering the world and rendering Satan's power or his weapons powerless, using his own weapons against him. And he decided to do so by coming man, by becoming man. And when Satan saw that, he must have thought that God made a crucial mistake because he said, I can't believe my good luck. As God, you know, Jesus can't die, but now that he's become a mortal, he can do something he couldn't do as God. As a human being, he can die. All I have to do is get him killed, and I will finally have my victory over God. And he found it childishly easy to get Judas Iscariot to betray him, the chief priest to accuse him of blasphemy and hand him over to Pilate, and for Pilate to buckle under the pressure and send him to his death even when he had no charge against him. And when Jesus hung dead on the cross, Satan must have been laughing his head off, saying, look at yourself. You call yourself a god. You came telling them how much you love them and that you came to free them. And what did they do? They confused you with me and they hung you on a cross and killed you in a manner that is reserved only for the worst of criminals. Well, where is your love for them now? They've totally betrayed you. They completely abandoned you. You call yourself a god. Well, let me tell you something. I think you're pathetic and I have finally beaten you. He couldn't have been more wrong because he didn't realize that by uh, killing Jesus, he brought into his own kingdom the one person more powerful than he, the one who had the key, if you can imagine, to unlock the shackles of all the people that had been ch chained there and the massive door to hell and released everybody from prison. And he swept the rug right out from under his victory and now used Satan's great weapon, death, against him. And for us today, yes, we will die, but when we die, it is now our entrance into heaven. It is not our entrance into condemnation. Jesus completely reversed that and destroyed the devil with his own power, with his own weapons. And we enter into that re resurrection. We inherit it on the day of our baptism. Last night, we had three people here who were baptized and, and uh, inherited eternal life with Jesus in the waters of baptism. And all of us, the day that we were baptized, we were cleansed of original sin, if adults, we were cleansed even of any actual sins we committed, and we were given a white garment to show our new dignity in Christ, the purity, and a candle lit from the Paschal candle, which we lit last night, to show the resurrection of Christ. And we were told, now you have inherited salvation. Now you have inherited heaven. And when Jesus returns in glory, the new creation. A perfect world where we will live with a perfect soul in a perfect body for all of eternity. And we inherited that the day of our baptism. And the Lord said, especially with that white garment, keep that dignity unstained into the everlasting life of heaven. But Satan, even though he knew he was destroyed by Jesus' resurrection, he figured it out then, he knows he still has one possibility left. And that is, uh, he can try to bring people away from God. He knows that it has to be our choice to follow him. Just being baptized doesn't guarantee us heaven. We have to stay on the path. And so, 
he tries to get us to abandon God and follow him instead. And he doesn't play fair. He doesn't come and tell us, hey, you know, I'm going to tempt you with these things that are lies or they may be pleasurable or convenient now, but you're going to end up paying the price of your eternal soul for it, and when you die, you're going to enter into my kingdom. Oh, he doesn't do that. He makes it look like something very enticing, very good, very pleasurable, maybe even something we think we need in this life. And he dangles it in front of us like a fisherman with a worm on a hook, just hoping we will bite. And if we do, he can just reel us in. And so he tries everything he can, and he puts ideas in our minds to try to help us justify it. Well, wouldn't God want you to have that? What if God wouldn't love, if God loves you, do you really think he would ask you to live without that in life? Do you really think he would ask you to do that or to live that lifestyle that's going to be so painful for you? Do you really think he would ask you to sacrifice you know, the way he did? Do you really think he would ask that? Of course, the answer is yes, but he puts in our mind the idea, no, if God loves you, he'll let you do whatever you want. And we listen, and he pulls us in. Fortunately, Jesus, even after our baptism, has given us a way to be freed from that in worthily receiving communion and in going to the sacrament of reconciliation. When we acknowledge our sins, the Lord takes the hook right out of our mouth and we swim away again to start all over. And so the Lord basically tells us, just follow me, listen to me, and everything will be fine. And it would be very easy for us if uh, we knew that any, any, or which of the things, rather, I should say, uh, are gifts from God and which are tricks from the devil. If it would be easier, in one sense, not desirable, but easier if we said everything enjoyable is automatically sinful. Well, we wouldn't be too happy, but at least we'd know that. The problem is, that's not the truth. There are many beautiful, wonderful gifts God has given us. As he told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, you may eat from the, all the trees of the garden. There are wonderful gifts he's given us to enjoy appropriately uh, and, be, and see them as gifts from him to make our lives on this life, on this earth, joyful and pleasing. But there are other ones that Satan is using as a trick against us. And how do we know the difference? Can we tell the little betrayal, like our pitcher you know, of flinching his left shoulder to let us know which is the sinker and which is the fastball? The answer is very simple. It comes from Jesus. And he says, yes, just listen to me. Just do what I tell you, what I teach you in the scriptures, through the church, whatever it may be. Listen to me. I am not wrong and I will not lie. I will not deceive you. Do what I tell you and you'll be golden. And the devil will have no power over you. And so actually the answer to following the Lord and getting through all the trials and avoiding all the tricks of Satan is very simple. Listen to Jesus and follow him. Now, that's not always easy to do because sometimes to follow Jesus we feel like we have to pick up our cross and follow him. And it may mean that we'll have to go through some suffering on this earth. But the Lord reminds us, I defeated it all. And just as Simon helped him carry the cross, he will help us carry the cross. And we may die on it, but we will rise with him. And we will have the victory. And we will have defeated Satan with his own weapons. Because remember that not only that, but Satan also brings evil into our lives. All the pain in the world that happens is not God's gift, God's gift to us. God doesn't create evil and pain and harm. Satan does. And he brings it into our lives, hoping we'll blame God for it. And for some people, it's childishly simple. They stub their toe and they shake their fist at God and say, what did I do to deserve this? You're not a good loving God. But if we endure all the pain that comes our way and instead of cursing God, which is what Satan wants us to do, but rather turn to God and say, Lord, help me endure this. Help me carry this cross, be there and let it bring me closer into you. Then we defeat the, defeat the devil with his own weapon because he's, he'll say, you know, I brought all this pain upon them so that they would curse God and I'd be able to pull them away. And instead they took all of that suffering I gave them and only let it draw them, uh, bring them further into the Lord's loving embrace. I lost them by my own weapon. And it would be like the devil shooting a gun and the bullet stopping midair, turning around and striking him. We defeat the devil with his weapons, with all the evil he brings in the world, not by cursing God, but by turning to God and saying, Lord, you are the truth. Help me carry this cross. And when we do that, 
salvation is ours, and we win the victory that Jesus has already guaranteed for us. My brothers and sisters, we inherited that the day that we were baptized, and the Lord tells us, just stay close to me, follow what I tell you, and I will give you salvation of your soul in my kingdom when your life here is over, and when I return in glory, your body will rise to the new creation to live in absolute perfection for all of eternity. And that is the wonderful gift we celebrate today, that Christ has won back for us what we lost by original sin. He restored our dignity and draws us into union with him in the waters of baptism and by receiving his body and blood as food so that we can actually become one with him. And when we go to heaven, we will actually be with Jesus on his throne celebrating with him because we are part of Christ and as Christ is, raising, is reigning in glory in heaven, you and I will do the same thing. And so today, let us celebrate with exceeding joy this beautiful day that Christ is risen from the dead. And remember that the greatest words the world has ever heard was the, were the words the angels spoke to the women that first Easter morning, you are looking for Jesus, the crucified one. He is not here. He has been raised. Hallelujah. Let's do that again. Hallelujah. That's better. Good.